Aren't you glad you're serving a God that can still do miracles? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, praise team. You may be seated for just a couple of moments. I want to go over some important announcements. As we started service tonight, it was raining here, and I was like, oh, I sure hope this doesn't affect our crowd that shows up tonight, and so I don't think it did. And then as we started worship, we looked out, and we saw a couple of uh, Alachua County uh, Sheriff's Department vehicles pull in under our canopy, and so I went out there to make sure that we're Okay, I quickly counted everybody's head to make sure that we didn't need to hide anybody in a broom closet real quick. And when I saw that we were compliant, I ran out there just to see. And they were getting out of the rain, but I had Brother Rios run out there with a phone to let them watch just this little segment of our service. Because I want to thank all of our first responders and all of our police officers for everything that you're doing to keep us safe and to serve our city and our community. Thank you so very much. And I know you can't see everybody that's associated with this church. We got hundreds of people watching online and we just want to say thank you. And we give you a hand clap and we appreciate you serving and putting yourself in harm's way every day, not just during this time, but every day. And I know there's just a couple of you out there, but you represent a great army. And so thank you so much for doing what you're doing. If you don't mind, Stan, let's, uh, uh, grab your Bibles, Philippians chapter number 3. Sister Robin is doing much better. And so uh, she was, was alert and awake today, but we want to keep praying for her. Also, Bishop is doing good. Keep praying for him. Everett Daughtery is doing good. They think they were able to get all of the cancer in his lung, but they saw a, another little spot on the other lung. So he's got a, a, some more stuff that's going to have to take place in a couple of weeks, but we want to keep praying for him. And then through all of this crazy crisis, our church is growing. And congratulations to Sean and Ashley Waith and baby Jude. And so we uh, congratulate them. Jude's been in and out of the hospital. I do think he got to go home today. And uh, man, Easter was just as good as it could be around here. So thank you so much for making Easter a, a success from just the service. I think we had over 14,000 views on our Facebook. So that's just incredible for that particular service. And then afterwards we had the parade and uh, what a great time we had. And it was just so good to see everybody. We stood under that canopy for over an hour uh, with cars just steadily streaming through. And it was so good. If you couldn't make it, I know you saw the video. So I want to thank Brother Tuselli for putting together such a great video for those that could not come. And so this Sunday, we're going to just continue uh, online service. I am believing and I am praying that some of these restrictions are going to be lifted sooner than later. Uh, if, uh, if the county doesn't lift them, I'm going to go down there and help them lift them. So, uh, but we're, we're just believing and praying. So this Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, just regular online service. Now, Sunday night, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to have a concert. We're going to just have a night of praise and worship and it's going to be good, and we'll have people streaming in and out of the church, so we'll still be within the confines of what we need to be. Uh, but we're going to have some, uh, we're going to have some old-timey songs by some uh, old-timey people. I hope they don't get offended by that. Uh, we're going to have some regular praise and worship. We're just going to have a little mixture of everything. I even heard a little rumor that we may have an accordion, and uh, so I'm excited about seeing that. It may go a little longer than what we've been going online, but it would just be good for people to go back and have some good music to listen to, so I'm looking forward to that. Philippians chapter number 3, verse 12, and I want to publicly say... To Brother Ryan and to everyone that helps him, thank you so much for what you've done the last few weeks to bring us into the presence of the Lord, to all of our musicians, to everyone who helps sing. Uh, thank you. And then to our deaf ministry that's here to make sure that we're able to get the message to, to our deaf. I'm just so appreciative of that. Um, verse number 12 of Philippians chapter 3, Paul writing to the church of Philippi. He said, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself 
to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But this one thing I do, I, I just did a little word search today on my uh, Bible program just the phrase, one thing, and that's a Bible study all in of itself, of the one thing that God requires in different settings, one thing. But what I want to focus on tonight, he said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forth unto those things which are before. My title is, One of the Hardest Things You Will Ever Do. One of the hardest things you will ever do. God bless you. You may be seated. Again, thank you if you haven't shared yet and you'd like to share it with your family and your friends on your Facebook, please do so. Amen. Things have been a little unique, and I'm sure we could say maybe even a little overbearing the last few weeks. And I would urge you again tonight to keep your faith, to maintain your expectation, and to maximize this opportunity to increase your relationship with God. I'm begging you as your pastor. Now, if I'm not your pastor, you do whatever you want to do. But I, if, if you're part of this church, I'm begging you, do not lose ground during this time. Don't make it to where you're going to need a month of Sundays when you get back to get back to where you were just when this quarantine started. When these doors are opened again, and again, I'm believing that's going to be sooner than later. When we come together to worship again, they're not just open back up for us. We're, I think we're going to be okay. What bothers me is that, that brand new people don't have a place to run to right now where they can come into the presence of the Lord in a church type Setting. I believe when we open up those doors, they're not just going to be open for us, but they're, they're going to be open for a brand new swell of, of, of brand new people who are ready to surrender their hearts to the Lord. So it would be in the best interest of everyone involved for the saints to still be the saints when we get back. And for us to come back ready to serve and ready to help and ready to minister to the lost, the hurting, and the confused in our Community. I hope that makes sense. I'm not saying you got to, you know, I'm just, you, you don't lose ground. If this is your church, don't lose ground during this season. I know the virus has been talked about as the invisible enemy. September the 11th, we, uh, 2001, we had an, a visible enemy. We were attacked and the country came up with these five levels of risk for terrorism. You would have the green level, which would be the, a low risk. You'd have a blue level, which would be a guarded risk. You'd have the yellow level, which would be a significant risk. You'd have the orange level. Now, that'd be a high risk. But then the fifth level was called the red level. And the red level meant that it was a severe risk of terrorist activity. I, I believe that, that this whole quarantine issue is is creating an atmosphere for a severe risk of revival outbreak when this is all said and done. I believe seeds are being planted in the spirit world right now that there's going to be a great harvest when all this is done. So in the midst of an almost empty sanctuary, I prophesied to you tonight that the, the risk of revival in the city of Gainesville is not at the green level, and it's not at the blue level, and it's not at the yellow level, and it's not even at the orange level. That may have been what it was a month or so ago, but, but we are so close to a life-changing breakthrough, a life-altering outpouring, a door open that no man can shut revival, that it puts us on the red level. Red, because when this revival starts flowing, the blood of Jesus is going to wash away sin, infirmities, shortcomings, and mistakes. We are at a high level of revival. Drug addicts are not safe right now. Backsliders are not safe to remain in the pig pen. Those who said they would never be Pentecostal have caught themselves 
clapping their hands during an online service or patting their foot during praise and worship. Be careful. We're at a red level. Businessmen are not safe. Leaders in our community are not safe. When this revival begins to sweep this through this city, it's going to sweep the entire city because the Bible says that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Somebody shout, we're at a high level. We're at a high risk level of revival. We cannot allow the last five or six weeks to steal our excitement, our momentum, and most of all, our vision. Our vision has got to be bigger than us. Because if we can do it, then the vision is not of God. God does not give dreams that we are capable of fulfilling. Ask Joseph. But he will give us dreams so big, so bold, that in order to see the fulfillment of that dream, we're going to have to fully trust him to have that dream come to pass. And this is where many of us fail. Because we either write the dream off, or we try to fulfill it ourselves getting in the way of God and messing up everything in the process. So, so our lesson tonight is one of the hardest things you will ever do. And you might think, well, the hardest thing I've ever done is trying to discover the potential for my life. Or maybe the hardest thing I've ever done is trying to fulfill the potential that I think is in my life. Or maybe one of the hardest things you've ever done is to not kill your spouse during this time of quarantine. Mm, help me, Holy Ghost. I feel like I'm helping somebody right now. One of the hardest things you say you've ever done is try to not beat your kids to death during this time of homeschooling. I saw a meme this week that really summed it up real well. It said, some of you parents are about to find out that it wasn't the teacher's fault. (laughs) There's a lot of good truth to that. And while all those things and many more are hard, that's not going to be the hardest thing that you'll ever have to do. I think most of us know what it is that we should or could be doing for the kingdom of God. Most every one of us that's connected to this church, that's watching this webcast, you know what God wants you to do for the kingdom of God. But for some reason or another, we we do not do it or we do not do it to the fullest extent that it could be done. And, And so if you don't remember anything else that I say tonight, remember this. We will, as a church, as a body, we will fulfill our vision. Not when we get another building, not when we start another ministry, not when we get an X amount of money. We will fulfill our vision when each and every one of us as a body, we're truly doing and fulfilling what God wants us to do for the kingdom of God. When the arm starts being the arm, and when the leg starts being the leg, and when the eye starts being the eye, and when the ear starts being the ear, when all that starts working in harmony and in unity, then the will of God, the dream, will come to pass. So we must be constantly aware and cautious of anything that might take us away from our calling or from the fulfillment of our ministry. Now, if you still got your Bibles nearby, um, and for all of you that just use your Bible on the phone and you're trying to watch a service on the phone, you're in a little quandary right now. Uh, but, but if you do have your Bibles, you can turn. If not, it'd be on the screen. Acts chapter number 6, verse number 1 says, uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 1 says, In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose murmuring. Uh, there's always going to be some murmuring when the church grows. You, you can't have revival without having somebody upset about something. Because their widows were neglected. Verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. It's not that they were above it. Obviously they weren't. They were doing it. But he was just saying, by doing that, we're neglecting some other areas. Verse 3, so because of that, look out among you seven men. And for all of you that, 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 that have an issue with the church having platform policies or standards for leadership to live by, they had it. 
from the very beginning. In Acts chapter 6, he didn't say just anybody can do this. He said, I want you to find seven men of honest report that's full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. So that teaches me that you can have the Holy Ghost and be dumb. I've met some dumb Holy Ghost filled people. He said, I don't want those folks waiting tables. I want you to find those that are with. I'm not looking at anybody. I'm not even looking at the camera because I don't want you to think I was looking at you when I said you were Holy Ghost and dumb. Everybody in Gainesville got the Holy Ghost and wisdom. It's those other churches that I pastored. That's who I'm talking to unless they're watching. And then it wasn't them. It's somebody else. It's where I used to preach at. Anyhow, because find those full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom who we can appoint over this business. So we will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The church in the book of Acts was growing. The vision that from God was being fulfilled. The preachers was having to do more than just preach, and it was causing some stress. And, and how many know stress can cause arguments? You have felt that over the last few weeks, no doubt. And they realized what was happening, and they said, we're going to fix the problem. And the way they fixed the problem was they empowered the people to do certain things. Remember, the vision will come to pass... When each and every one of us are truly doing and fulfilling what God wants us to do. There were men in that church that was well capable of waiting on those tables. And so when they got involved, the church grew more and more. Look at verse number 7 of Acts chapter 6. And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now notice what happened. When the preachers devoted more time to prayer and study, the Word of God increased. I'll say it like this. The sermons got better. And when the sermons got better, that's what that's some of y'all praying. Man, let's give the pastor some help so those sermons will get better. And, and when the sermons got better, then the numbers of disciples multiplied. And, and, and the Bible says not just people, sinners were being converted, but it says many priests were obedient to the faith. Or I could say it like this. This would be in context. Different religions or different denominations were accepting and were open to the apostles' doctrine. All because everybody was doing what they were supposed to be doing at that. But wouldn't it be awesome for God to not just give us a revival of sinners, and we want that, but wouldn't it be awesome if God opened up the name of Jesus and the oneness of God and the wonderful infilling of the Holy Ghost? Wouldn't it be awesome if God opened up that revelation to other churches and they would never even come to our church, but the whole church would be converted? What kind of revival could we tap into when God starts converting churches when all the priests, it says, were converted. But tonight I want to focus and I want to kind of laser point or zero in not so much on what we should do, but I want to focus on why we probably don't do what we should do. I believe most of us know what to do. So I want to focus on the fact why we don't do it. The list is not long. I'm going to make it very short for us tonight. We can say, well, there's many reasons for this and there's many reasons for that. And, and there may be hurdles you have to jump. That's why my title is not the hardest thing you'll have to ever do. My title is one of the hardest things. Intimidation robs us from reaching our potential. A lack of faith robs us from reaching our potential. Lack of godly counsel keeps us from obtaining what we need to get a hold of. Bishop called me this week and, 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 and he told me, he said, hey, I feel like I've got a word from the Lord for you, talking about me. And I was like, speak, Bishop. And, and when he got through and when I shared it with my wife and I told him immediately and my wife seconded it and if I were to tell it to you every one of you that know me would second it Bishop said hey this is what I think the Lord's saying for you and this is what you need to do and this is what you need to refrain from doing and I said I received that word from the Lord but a lack of godly counsel can keep us from obtaining what God wants us to get a hold of a lack of wisdom can keep us back but, but Philippians chapter 3 tells us really one, one of the reasons that, that is the hard, and, and I'm telling you, it's going to be one of the hardest things we'll ever do. And I hope it, hope it makes sense to you like it did. It started going through my mind yesterday and I woke up this morning, couldn't get it off. So here we go. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, I haven't already attained, he said. 
I'm not already perfect. I follow after, if I may apprehend that, for which also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. Now, I'm going to bore you, and I'm going to read it again. I don't think this will be on the screen, but this is the living Bible. It says, I don't mean to say that I'm perfect. I haven't learned all that I should even learn yet. But I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers, I am still not all I should be. This is Paul talking. But I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. He said, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us up to heaven because of what Christ Jesus did for us. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind or those things which are in the past. One of the hardest things you will ever do, but one of the most needful things that you must do is forget those things which are behind. Let yesterday be yesterday. Let last year be last year. Let Hey, you know what's going to be the greatest service beyond us having our first service back? The greatest service, and we had already planned this this year, to have a watch night service uh, coming up this year to kind of see the old year out and the new year in. We had already talked about that and planned that, that we wanted to do that before all this started. But you talk about a year that I want to set up and make sure that I see it get out of the way and that a new year comes in, that's going to be a powerful service. And so what we're going to have to get to the place where we forget about our mistakes. We forget about everything that happened a year ago. Some of you are not doing what God wants you to do because you hung up on something that happened 10 years ago and the people you're mad at have already died and you can't do, and you're still reliving it. Every opportunity, one of the hardest things you will ever do is to forget those things which are behind. That's why you're not doing what God wants you to do. That's why I don't step out of the boat and do what God wants me to do. At various, because you're constantly being reminded. Now the word forget there means to fail to remember. To put out of one's mind. The Greek word means to forget, neglect, no longer care for. Listen to this Greek definition. Given over to oblivion. Man, I was like, ooh, oblivion. Ooh, that's a fun word to say. Oblivion. So I was like, well, what does oblivion mean? So I looked up the word oblivion. It means the state of being unaware of what is, like your teenagers, like your kids right now. They're, they're in the oblivion. They, they're, they don't even know what's happening. And then this is another definition for oblivion. Amnesty. Or pardon. Hmm. Amnesty or pardon. We have all forgotten stuff. Amen. Has, uh, let me get out and grab my keys real quick. How many's ever lost their keys before or, or forgot where you put your keys? Maybe it's the right thing. Or what about wallet? You know, I forgot where I put my wallet. These, these are probably two of the most looked for items. What did I do with my wallet? What did I do with my what, Where's my keys? Where's my keys? Where's my keys? Where's my keys? We've all done that. Some of you have, have done worse. You have forgotten anniversaries. You have forgotten birthdays. We shall pray for every man in our church that has had to bear that cross. When we forget these things, car keys, birthdays, anniversaries, wallets, when we forget where we put those things, we don't just move on. We try to make it right. We buy bigger gifts to cover up the forgetfulness of the birthday or the anniversary. We turn the house upside down looking for a key or looking for a wallet. And we don't really move back into our lane until we find what we forgot. But that's not what Paul is referring to here. 
when he says we must forget those things which are behind. To, to apply that same, I, I forgot where I put my keys. I forgot what's behind. If we, the way some of us do is we go all, all the way back trying to look for what we're supposed to be forgetting. Saying, well, I can't move on until I find those keys. Maybe God wanted you to lose those keys. Now, it's not how we act when we lose the key to our car. It's not how we act when we lose our wallet because we know we've got to find that that's important. But can you imagine losing your keys, forgetting where you put your keys, forgetting where you put your wallet, and then just saying, oh, well, no big deal. We'll just, I'll just get another car. I didn't need that money anyhow, so it's fine. We wouldn't do that because we're not programmed to think like that. But yet, here's Paul saying, you've got to forget. There are some things that are in our past Forget you. I'll talk about me. There's some things in my past that I don't want to go back and find. That I don't want to go back and discover. That I don't want to go back and go, oh, that's where I put that. That's why, that's why you got to be careful. Of, oh, now I'm just going to meddle for a little bit, but that's, nobody's here, so I'll just meddle anyhow. Uh, that, you, that's why you got to be careful of uh, the music you listen to and, and, and TV shows that you watch and things you get associated with and people you follow on social media because if you're not careful, some of that stuff will be hooks that will pull you back into what God's trying to get you to forget. And the Bible said, had it entered back into the mind of the children of Israel, they'd have went back to Egypt. So it had to get out of their mind before it ever got out of their feet. And if we don't get it out of our mind, our feet will take us back to those things. One of the hardest things you'll ever do is to truly forget those things which are behind. Now, here's the reality. Every one of us in here, we well, in here out there. We've all made mistakes. We've all dropped the ball. We've all done things we should not have done. And I'm not talking about before you were in church. Yeah, let that go. I'm talking about once you got in church, after you repented, after you got baptized in Jesus' name, after you spoke in tongues, we still weren't perfect people. The Bible says to the church of Rome, chapter 3, verse 23. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Paul wrote to a bunch of saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost-filled people. And he said, all of you have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that sin and that shortness and that lack of glory and because of those mistakes and because of the bad... Again, I'm not talking about... Pre-Calvary, I'm talking about after we got in the church and we still messed up and we still did things we didn't want to ever do. Because of those sins and because of those mistakes and because of those things that we've committed, we carry around. Now, if you were here, you'd be shouting with me right now because you know it's the truth. We carry around so much guilt and condemnation on our shoulders that it keeps us bogged down that we can't even worship like we want to worship because we got all this weight on us. We definitely can't sign up for some type of ministry to serve in some way because we've got all this weight upon us. And guilt and condemnation are probably two of the main reasons why people never reach their potential in the kingdom of God. Therefore, one of the hardest things you will ever do is to forget those things, those things that you did that you wish you wouldn't have done, to forget it. You've been pardoned. One of the definitions of oblivion was you've been parted. And when you've been parted, you don't have to go back. You don't have to relive. You don't have to always think about. The blood of Jesus has a way of pardoning us and washing away our sins. Now, this is going to get deep, so you need to get a pen out right now, because you're going to need to write this down, because this is going to like at my funeral, somebody's going to say, oh, I remember when Brother Tony made this one statement. This is going to be like, you know, the expectation is the birthplace of the miraculous. This is going to be one of those statements. It's going to be on banners. It's going to be on billboards. We'll probably have coffee mugs with it on it. I mean, this is, going to, this is deep. Are you ready? Every morning that you wake up, yesterday is behind you. Whew. I must rest now. Whew. Virtue has left my body. Every morning that you wake up, yesterday is behind you. No wonder the Bible says every morning His mercies are renewed. So when you wake up, whatever was in your yesterday, whatever mistakes, whatever mishaps, whatever struggles, that's in your yesterday. That's behind you. You have a commandment from God to now forget that. 
Do not go back to that. I'm not teaching that we can willfully sin and then just forget about it. I'm not remotely teaching that. But you cannot build a future from yesterday. You cannot build a future from yesterday. You've got to forget those things which are behind. The Bible teaches against that in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, or, or Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Paul says, shall, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Just because there is forgiveness does not mean that we can just sin on purpose and expect forgiveness without consequence. And so while I'm here, let me just try to pastor and clear up. It's a Bible study. Let's clear up some stuff. I know how the devil works. The way the devil works is to take the Word of God and twist it. And twist it just enough to confuse us. And twist us just enough to condemn us. And to frustrate us. So that we will not be able to fulfill what God wants us to fulfill. And if you don't believe that, just go back to Genesis chapter 3. And you'll see the way that sin was introduced into the world. Was the devil just taking the word of God and twisting it just a little bit. Because there are verses in the Bible that says things like Hebrews chapter 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh. And to put him in an open shame. Now when you'll read that, the devil will immediately begin to twist that. And, be, and begin to say, well, you, you've had the Holy Ghost. You've tasted the good word of God. You've enjoyed some powerful church services. And, and you messed up. And now, I mean, look at this. There's no, you can't even repent anymore. You're, you're crucifying the Son of God again. So you might as well not even go to church. And if that's not enough for the devil to twist and discourage you, then you got verses like Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 says, For, for if we sin willfully... After that, we've received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And so, whoo, the devil will be like, aha, there's another verse right there. So you, you know you've got the truth, and, and, and now you've, you've sinned. And, and so every sin and every thought and every temptation and every wrong desire and every lustful moment, every prideful moment, every time you did, looked, thought, acted out things you shouldn't have done, the devil jumps up on your shoulder, and he reminds you of those things. And instead of forgetting those things, you're constantly replaying them in your mind. And then you read scriptures like I just read to you, and you feel condemned. You feel beat down, confused, aggravated. So you just throw in the towel and go, how in the world can I make it? I've already messed up too much. I, blah, 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 blah. And in the process of being weighed down with worry and self-condemnation, you're not productive in the kingdom of God. Making the devil victorious in your life. Well, it only takes about one good verse to shoot a hole in a doctrine. So let me read some other verses to you. If the devil's been trying to remind you of those I just read, the devil won't remind you of these. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things write unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The devil's not going to remind you of that verse. He's not going to remind you of Micah chapter 7 and verse 8 when the writer said, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. The devil's not going to come down in your lowly time and start whispering Romans 8, 34 in your ear. It is Christ that died, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. He's not going to tell you that. He's not going to remind you what the Lord told Peter in Matthew chapter 18 when he said, How oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I'll say unto thee, until not just until seven times, times, but until 70 times 7. So here's the reality. We will sin. We will miss the mark after coming to the knowledge of the truth. We will fall. We will stumble. We will do things we ought not to do. But that does not mean that we are eternally lost. It doesn't mean that 
We have sinned willfully, like it said in Hebrews, and so there's no more sacrifice. It doesn't mean that we, we can't repent and we've crucified Him afresh. That's not what it means. The first thing we need to do in order to forget those things which are behind us is to understand Scripture and to not allow the devil to take one Scripture and condemn you with it. Here's what we learn in Hebrews. So let's go back to that for a minute. Just have a little Bible study. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, having tasted the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost, have tasted the good word of God, the powers of the world to come, if they should fall away, to renew them again into repentance. Verse 6 says, the, the key phrase there is if they should fall away. That term literally means to apostatize. Apostasy means the rejection or the abandonment of faith. In other words, it was people who knew the truth, lived the truth, preached the truth, but for some reason has turned their back on the truth, has denounced the truth, and here's another phrase for it, and has blasphemed the Holy Ghost. And they have seared their conscience with a hot iron is what the Bible says. Jesus said in Mark chapter 3 that all sins shall be forgiven. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. And so probably one of the most often asked questions among especially Pentecostal people is, have I blasphemed the Holy Ghost? I, I'm afraid I blasphemed. I smoked a cigarette. Did I blaspheme the Holy Ghost? I, I, I messed. I cussed. Did I blaspheme the Holy Ghost? I, 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 I said something bad about the preacher. Did I blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Listen, you can sin. You can stumble. You can even fall. And when you do that, God will forgive you. He will stabilize you. And He will pick you back up. But you hear me. Don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. So what do you mean? Backsliding is not blaspheming. If you backslide, that just means you walk away. You turn from the truth. You're not denouncing the truth. You're just walking away from the truth. And so therefore, you have backslid. Blasphemy means that, hey, now I'm going to preach. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. And you don't have to have the Holy Ghost. And we were wrong. And you don't have to live holy. And you don't have to live separated. And you can do anything you want to do. That's blasphemy. There's a big difference. The prodigal son backslid. He did not blaspheme. Therefore, he knew how to get back to daddy's house. They didn't build a church in the pig pen. They wanted him to leave the pig pen and come back to daddy's house. That's how you can tell if you backslid or if you've blasphemed. If you'd rather the church come and be as filthy and as dirty and as perverted as you in the pig pen, or are you ready to get out of the pig pen and get back to daddy's house? That's how you can tell, oh, I've backslid. I'm tired of the pigs. I'm tired of the mud. I'm tired of the slop. I'm ready to go back to daddy's house. You've backslid. But when you're comfortable there and you want your preacher to get in the same mud with you, now you may have blasphemed. I hope that makes sense. I hope this is helping you like it helped me. Quit letting the devil tell you, you messed up, you sinned, you had a bad thought, therefore you've tasted the heavenly gift, and now there's no more room for repentance from you. No, it's talking about those who have turned, those who have blasphemed, those who have walked away from the truth. Now that same Paul, which I believe probably wrote the book of Hebrews, listen to what else this Paul said. Romans chapter 7, and again, I'm going to read out of the Living Bible just because it's, it's easily understandable for this particular passage. Verse 17 says, But I can't help myself because I'm no longer doing it. Paul said, It is sin inside me that is stronger than I am that makes me do these evil things. I know that I am rotten through and through. So far as my old sinful nature is concerned, no matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. When I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyhow. Now, if I'm doing what I don't want to, it is plain where the trouble is. Sin still has me in its evil grasp. It seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. And many of you could testify amen on verse 21. I want to do what's right. I keep doing what's wrong. 
Verse 22, I love to do God's will so far as my new nature is concerned. But there is something else deep within me in my lower nature that is at war with my mind. And it wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. In my mind, I want to be God's willing servant. But instead, I find myself still enslaved to sin. So you see how it is. My new life tells me to do right. But the old nature that is in me tells me to still love the sin. Oh, what a terrible predicament I am in. Who will free me from my slavery to this deadly, lowly, lower nature? Thank God. It has been done by Jesus Christ our Lord. He has set me free. Now, the Apostle Paul is admitting that he had a problem. His flesh was warring against his spirit. Just because your flesh wars against your spirit doesn't mean you can't be forgiven. He wanted to do good. And he did evil. He tried to get away from evil and he actually ended up running to it. Now, I believe Paul was forgiven. I believe he was still used of God. I believe he still had a ministry to do. So I want you to hear me tonight. One of the hardest things that you will ever do is forgetting those things which are behind. And the reason why this is so hard is because that is 99% of the devil's ammunition. If he can keep you in your past, if he can keep you living in regret, then your present is worthless and your future is wasted. So let me set the record straight tonight. We We have all made stupid mistakes. We've all done things we shouldn't have done. We've all got skeletons in our closet. We've all said or done things that we would be embarrassed if anybody ever found out. But if you want to be used by God, then you must do this one thing. And it will probably be one of the hardest things you ever do. But you got to constantly discipline your mind to forget those things which are behind. Quit letting the devil tell you you're not forgiven. Quit letting the enemy tell you that you can't be used. Quit letting the world tell you that you've done too much. God wants us to forget some things. He wants us to move forward. He wants to use you. He wants to bless you. But He wants you to leave your past in the past. Forgetting those things which are behind. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. All this little preachy, happy, clappy junk you hear about, oh, we're just going to forgive and forget. They're lying to you. They may forgive you, but you're not forgetting. That takes a discipline. You don't just, somebody doesn't walk up, kick you in the face, and then say, oh, I'm sorry, brother, forgive me. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I forgive him, forget you. And next time you see him, be like, man, there's something about you I just can't remember. No, you're going to put a face mask on every time they're around. You're going to make sure that they're not, you know, let me see them kind of picking their leg up. You're going to pull back. Why? Because you remember that stuff. So it's a discipline. It's one of the hardest things you will ever do. The devil is constantly, I'll bet you every little dollar I got, and I don't think we're supposed to bet, but I'm going to forget those things which are behind. Uh, but I, I, I'd, I'd wait. I don't think we're supposed to. Anyhow, I, I, I'd bet every dollar that Brother Arnold's got that through, through the last four or five weeks, the devil has allowed this time that you haven't been in church and I know, I know I got friends that want to think that their whole church is reading their Bible seven hours a day. And, and, and you know, they're praying the other 12 hours a day and they're just sleeping a little bit. I, I believe there's been more junk watched. I believe Netflix is broke. I believe Amazon Prime is broke. TV's broke. Redbox is broke. Everything is broke because we're just consuming stuff. And I would bet you, I would bet you all of Brother Arnold's money that... The devil in the last few weeks have tried to remind you of junk you've done and then say things like, well, I wouldn't even go back to church if I was you. doesn't matter when they open the doors. You're not worthy to go anyhow. You ought to be the first one banging on the door. When are you going to let me in this place? Because here's what I want you to understand. The same Paul that said, I got this struggle going on. The same Paul wrote Romans chapter 8. Now, Romans chapter 7 is where we ended with this big struggle going on. And you got to understand, when the Bible was being written, it didn't have chapters and verses. Paul didn't say, now I'm going to change the subject and I'm going to go chapter 8, verse 1. We put chapters and verses in there. We, as in men, put chapter and verses in there so we can find stuff, so we can be easier for us. So there, that wasn't like that in the original. So as soon as he made this big confession that he 
battles within himself. He said this in Romans chapter 8 verse 1. But there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. You know what Paul was saying after he confessed his shortcoming. He was saying but you know what I don't have any condemnation. I walk not after the flesh. I walk after. You know what Paul was saying is I have, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. I wake up every morning and I say thank God for mercy. And I let the past be the past. You go, need to go ahead and forget all the junk you've done, all the places you've been, all the sins that you've committed. But just like baptism is a command, so is forgetting those things which are behind. If you don't learn how to move forward, if you don't learn how to forget some things, it's going to stunt your growth. You're not going to, it's hard to do it. I know it's hard. I've been pastoring for over 20 years been preaching since I was 17. This is all I know. This is all I know. And I know sometimes just to get up and preach a sermon, the devil will still remind a preacher of something he did 15 years ago just to try to steal the thunder from that sermon. you got to constantly forget those things which are behind. Let's all stand. Now, I, I've, I've just focused on one thing. That's behind. It may not be failures that you have to forget. He didn't say just forget the failures. He said forget those things which are behind. It may be successes that you need to forget. Because if you're still living on a success from yesterday, you're not able to fulfill what God has for you today. So I'm going to look back at our text. I'll just stand. And Paul said, I haven't already gotten to where I needed to be. Verse 12. He said, but I, I, verse 13, I don't count myself. I'm nobody. I'm not trying to elevate myself is what he's saying. But this one thing I do. I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting. I want you to notice it says forgetting. It doesn't say I forgot. It says it's forgetting. Why? Because that shows you that it's continual. It's constantly. I'm having to continually do this. It's not a one trip to the altar that I forget my past. I'm forgetting it. Forget it would simply mean to forget it once, but forgetting makes it a process. It makes it continual. See, some of you, even the devil has beat you up because you've been trying to forget. You've been forgetting. And the devil said, well, if, if you really was living for God, you wouldn't still be thinking like that. That's not the way it works. And the reason why it's got to be continual is because there isn't just one thing you need to forget just one time. If you're like me, it's many things that you need to forget. Notice he said this one thing. What one thing do you think it is? Well, if we look back at the verse, the one thing that I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and that's not where he stops. He says, and I reach forth unto those things which are before. Now, when I looked at this today, I thought, well, that's not one thing. That's two things that he's doing. He's forgetting those things which are behind, and he's reaching into those things which are before. But he plainly said, the one thing I do. I'm forgetting and I'm reaching. There are not two separate things in this passage that we need to do. The conjunction and ties forgetting and reaching together and makes the two one. And here's what I think the Holy Ghost spoke to me today. You cannot successfully forget the past without at the same time reaching toward the future. And you cannot reach toward the future successfully while still remembering the past. So in order for me to reach forward, I've got to forget what's behind. And in order for me to forget what's behind, I've got to reach forward. They work together. Paul said it like this in Romans chapter 8. I am persuaded, I'm convinced, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Notice he said, I am persuaded that nothing present, that's right now. And he said, nothing in the future can separate me from the love of God. But in all of his little list, he did not say anything about the past. Because he knew that if you dwelled in your past, that's the only thing that can separate you. From the love of God. No wonder he said this one thing you must do. No wonder it's one of the hardest things that you'll ever do. He emphasized forgetting those things which are behind. I wonder tonight how many of us 
need a reminder to forget. (laughs) Put it in your phone. In the morning, Siri, remind me at 8 o'clock in the morning to make sure that I forget some things. Remind me to forget. Maybe you're watching this lesson and you know that you're not living in the level that God wants you to live. And it's not because you don't have the potential. It's not because you don't have the opportunity. It's not because of any of that. It's just because you're constantly remembering things in the past. The devil's holding a cloud of condemnation over your head. But you hear your pastor tonight. Forget those things. Some of you are living in success. Well, boy, back in my day, we had to... That's fine. Forget it. You got to move on. We're not there anymore. You still got to move ahead. We all need to forget the past. We all need to look toward the future. I want you to slip your hands up. I've invited them to come. and They're just going to sing a chorus here for a little bit. I want you to pray where you are. I want you to step out from the past. Don't worry about If everybody else wants to keep you there, let them do that. That, let them stand before God. I'm talking about you. You forget those things which are behind. God's got His hand on you. God's got His hand on this church. God's got His hand on every family. But we got to forget those things which are behind. Let's pray right now. Let's ask God to touch our homes. Let's ask God to touch our families. Amen.